Hello again and welcome to the LSU Sports Insider Podcast. Today is a rainy Thursday, September the 5th. I'm Zach Ewing with Sheldon Mickles, Scott Rabelais, and Koki Riley. Ready to turn the page from LSU's season opening loss to USC. We're going to talk Nichols State today and preview that game. And yeah, there's some things to talk about. Look, we all think LSU is going to win this game easily, but uh, we'll, we'll preview it. We'll talk about what we would like to see from the Tigers and give our predictions at the end. Also, with the NFL starting tonight, we're going to give some Super Bowl predictions. And we are also going to say farewell to Sheldon Mickles, who I'm, I'm not going to say the R word, but you are no longer working by choice as of Saturday <laughs> night. When I shut down the computer Saturday night, I'm done. So, so LSU Nichols will be his last event working uh, at the Advocate, and this is a celebratory thing. This is a good thing, and so we'll talk about that as well. I uh, want to let you know that the LSU Sports Insider podcast is brought to you by Waste Pro. Tiger fans, if you're planning a tailgate or event, keep your guests comfortable with portable toilets from Waste Pro. Call 225-744-6400 and mention the LSU Sports Insider for a special offer. Uh, going to take a quick break, and then we'll get back to it with um, talking about Nichols, talking about if LSU should change the way it's scheduling, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we'll be back right after this. Fellas, it's clear why Caesars brought us together. This is the ultimate quarterback roundtable. Uh, I think I know why we're here. What? Quarterback, high school, Oklahoma. I thought that was a musical. Garth, I think you're here because when people use Caesars Sportsbook, they earn with Caesars rewards. Things like celebrity chef dining, Vegas vacations, even tickets to your show. This app is over the top. There's the idea. Hit me! Bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Earn Caesars rewards and see your favorite quarterback, Garth Brooks, in concert. Hey, you can't throw like that. You know how far I've gone. Now I'm home again. I'm feeling more alive these days than I've ever been. At the Baton Rouge Clinic, our sole focus is to provide exceptional health care for your entire family so that you can get back to doing what you love most. We are caring for generations. You gave me love. Gave me love. All right, back on the LSU Sports Insider podcast, ready to turn the page to Nichols State. LSU plays Nichols at 6.30 p.m. on Saturday night at Tiger Stadium. If you're not going to the game, it's on ESPN Plus and SEC Network Plus. You officially have two days to figure out how you going to watch it, get that ESPN Plus subscription. Especially if you have DirecTV, right? Yeah. Well, if you have DirecTV, you're going to have to figure out a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, you know, pr probably time to call your cable provider or YouTube TV or whatever your choice is. But, yeah, LSU's turning the pace to Nichols, and um, I think they're ready to do that. I think we're ready to do that, guys. Like, it's it's time to move on. It's time to kind of put the USC loss in the past and, and find out what the rest of the season holds. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things to work on, obviously, uh, if, you know, after a, a loss like that for USC where you, you feel like you squandered the game. I mean, you had a chance to, to control it, go up two scores, and then the USC gets two touchdown drives at the end. But So there's a lot for LSU to work on. They t everybody, it's a bit one of the biggest cliches in football. You can make the most improvement from your first to second game. So we're going to see if LSU improves. And it'll be, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be a little hard to discern because they're going to be playing a, a pretty outmatched opponent. No offense to Nichols, but you know, there, there should be things to look for. You know, fewer penalties, better run blocking, better pass coverage. You know, those things can be improved. Not everything was bad in the USC game. No. No, certainly not everything was bad. But they have, uh, there's plenty to work on and, and uh, there ha there's, it gives a lot more meaning to the Nichols State game than it maybe otherwise might have. And, and Koki, it, Rab's right. Not not everything's bad, and all hope is not lost here. Um, it, it, it was a painful loss, but not a devastating one in the era of the 12-team playoff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked a lot about that and similar subjects uh, when it came to the big picture of this season and even beyond with Brian Kelly after that, right after that USC game, just you and I on the podcast. And um, yeah, like I, again, like it's the season's not over and i think you were you even mentioned this you know before we started the show we've talked about this a million times mm -hmm. where a lot of lsu's toughest toughest games this season are home games mm -hmm. and they're pretty much if you had the rank like their next four or five toughest games that they're all the all but one of them are at home the a m game on the road is really the only exception to that so um if you if you run the table at home and you know, win the road games you're at least supposed to win, or with the exception of maybe the A&M game, then you're probably in the playoffs. So, um, with, with that said, then the, the, the season isn't over. I'd say. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it, it, this almost mirrors last year when they got blown out by Florida State and they had a short week to get ready for Grambling and they came back. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to be the same thing because they had the game in their hands. Like Scott mentioned that they one more score and they go up 11 points and probably win that game because there's going to be a lot less time on the clock for uh, USC to come back. But uh, I, I think they probably turned the page pretty quickly on Monday. Uh, they got back early, like almost 5 o'clock uh, Monday morning and probably had the rest of the day. I'm not sure, but I'm sure they had meetings uh, later that day, and I'm pretty sure they they were ready to get fo- looking forward to Saturday. Yeah, it's, it's going to be cathartic in a way, I think, to get out there and play somebody else and, and get a victory that, that we all expect. Um, one, one piece of bad news in today's injury report is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Clinic. Uh, John Emery, who looked good Sunday night in, in Las Vegas, uh, has torn his ACL, happened to practice, same thing that happened to him last year. Um, just just a pretty awful story for a guy who's kind of had a lot, of, a lot of stops and starts in his career and now, now another one. Absolutely, yeah, and I, he sort of gave them a spark in that second half with the running game. It was one of the few bright spots they had in the running game against USC, and a lot of that was because of what Brian Kelly said with his vision. Um, I, it, it, that was kind, that's kind of an underrated part, aspect of his game, at least according to Kelly. So uh, he did a really good job of finding the hole, hitting the hole, and uh, it's just taking advantage of it. And I don't know if he has quite the same explosiveness that he maybe had when he first arrived at LSU, and uh, he was getting bruised and nicked up quite a bit during preseason camp from what we saw. Um, but at the same time, they needed him. They really did need him, just given the fact that now the running back room only has three scholarship backs at the moment because of Trey Holly's situation. So um, I think you're going to have to see more Caden Durham, and he's he's all of a sudden become kind of an important player on this team now because, you know, Josh Williams has history. Josh Williams has a history of you know, little nicks and bruises here and there. He's not really a, like a um, – he can't really handle that – you know that true number one load right and you're gonna need him you're gonna need caleb jackson of course um so they're gonna need that third guy and i think durham's gonna be up durham has suddenly become like a pretty important player for this team this season yeah you know, i wrote in preseason when john emory there was a, a practice where he had to leave early because of his knee he was stretching his knee and you know and and you know he got hurt last november uh against florida i think it was um, so he was coming back pretty quick. And I wrote that they have a Finn running back room. Uh, at the time, they only had three. Well, they still only have three scholarship running backs, and one of them is a true freshman. And you need more. <laughs> they showed last year you need more than three. And uh, they're going to – I think that was one of the things that I was concerned about going into the season that a lot of people weren't talking about. You know, a lot of people talking about the wide receivers that – Everybody thought was going to be, you know, they were going to be okay at wide receiver, not what it was last year, obviously, but the potential to be okay. And then everybody was talking about the defense. You know, it defense has to do this, defense has to do And it's obviously true, but I don't think a lot of people pay, paid attention to the running back situation. You, you need depth there. You need numbers. That's the most important thing. It's not necessarily – the fact you don't necessarily have to have Leonard Fournette there, but you need to have you know four or five or maybe even more um, guys that you can at least rotate in, and uh, because that's just such a physically grueling position, and injuries like the Emory thing can happen at, at, at a moment's notice. Well, if you if you had Jaden Daniels, which we don't, which which they don't, mm. uh, you know you could get away with three scholarship running backs. It's easier to get away with easier, it at least. Yeah. yeah, it would be it'd be easier to manage. But at SEC, you know, there's going to be, like you said, more injuries. And Josh Williams has accumulated a few of those over the years. So it's, it's a real concern now. They had this problem two years ago, too. I mean, I, I, I don't think Emory got hurt, but, like, Josh Williams was dealing with some stuff by the end of the season, and they were down to only, like, two or three scholarship no, running backs that were healthy. One. It's, yeah. it's not just uh, depth, right? I mean, J- John Emory was their best running back Sunday night. We all talked about Caleb Jackson the whole – off season and, and maybe Caleb Jackson still has his breakout, but there's a little more pressure on him to make that happen now. So uh, today's show is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Clinic, your trusted health care provider in the heart of Baton Rouge. Whether you're in need of primary care, specialist services, or urgent care, the Baton Rouge Clinic has you covered with a team of dedicated and experienced professionals. Visit BatonRougeClinic.com to learn more or to schedule your appointment today. The Baton Rouge Clinic, caring for generations. Um, another storyline for this weekend as we continue 
along the LSU Sports Insider podcast. Rab, you wrote a book about this. LSU uh, Tiger Stadium is turning 100 this year. Happy birthday to Tiger Stadium. Uh, it's a big one. It's a milestone one. And I, I know you've personally, and Sheldon, you two have seen a lot of the changes take place over this thing. I mean, it, it's gone from kind of like a, a pasture out there to like a city unto itself. And it, it, like, it's, it's just a good time to kind of sit back and celebrate it as, as we get into the season opener here. Yeah, neither of us were there for the first game in 1924. Just, absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I remember one of our former sports, the late Ted Castillo, who was our prep guru for many years before Robin Fambro. I asked him one time, Ted, what was your first game at Tiger Stadium? He said, 1931. It was the year they put lights in Tiger Ted Stadium. It was 1931. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I was like, man, that, that goes way, way, way back. But yes, it's the 100th anniversary of Tiger Stadium. Uh, it was... Uh, you know, it was. If you look, I've got a picture in the in the book uh, that's coming out. Uh, the bell pipe. A lot of people have probably seen. It's just kind of sitting out there. Yeah, you know, there wasn't. Uh, there wasn't or any, hardly any other buildings on campus. In fact, where people know the campus, Swine Palace, the the old. It's like an agricultural facility. It was one of the first other buildings built there. That's where the team went and dressed out, and they walked to the stadium. You know, a few hundred yards. And Tulane, uh, there were no locker rooms for Tulane. Uh, they had to dress on the train, which is the train siding, which is still the same place over there on, on the on the west side of Nicholson Drive. But yeah, it's it's grown piecemeal over the years. It was 12,000 seats to start with and it's been added to. They added lights. They made it into a horseshoe, made it into a bowl, added the upper decks, and now it's obviously a 102,000 seat stadium. When I was at the Olympics talking to people from Europe, they couldn't believe that. I said, yeah, I live two miles away from a 100,000 seat college sports stadium because college sports don't basically don't exist in Europe, you know, and they couldn't, couldn't quite believe that. But yeah, it is now, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's still old school, but it's obviously they've modernized it. We saw last week, the new, the new huge scoreboard in the North end zone and the ribbon scoreboards that are all synced up. And they were, we were out there, we were leaving interviews last night. They were, you can see them testing the, the new lights that are going to go on and off in tiger stadium. So it's going to be a blend of old and new. I think it's going to be interesting to see, uh, this year at Tiger Stadium uh, as it celebrates the 100th anniversary and, and, and they, they have stuff planned all year long. So it's going to be an inter interesting season. As that it's a great way to put it. It's a blend of old and new because, you you know, when you're watching a game on TV, you know it's Tiger Stadium. They have the yard lines marked every five yards instead of ten. They have the double right. uh, double goal, goal posts. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Supports, I guess you'd say. And, and you're right. It's, it's just – it's almost like a – you don't want to – we all live around it. We all see it every week. It's not, not anything special to us in that standpoint. But you mentioned Europe. My sister-in-law was visiting from Germany a few weeks ago, and we were driving over the Mississippi River Bridge on I-10, and she, what is that arena? You know, you can see, like, you can see it from a <laughs> long way away. Of course. Like, it, it's, it is a landmark, and it's, it's uh, obviously to Tiger fans a very special place, Shell. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, they, they, going back to that, whenever you come across the river, especially at night, they keep those scoreboards in the south end zone, the video boards are on all all the time because they can't turn them off or there's some reason. I don't know if the new ones are going to be any different, but it, it is striking. I mean, it's almost as striking as the state capitol on, on your left when you're coming, a, coming across the bridge. And, you know, uh, talking what Scott was talking about, all the old days, um, SEC did a series, I think it was about a seven-part, about a year or two ago, and they showed an LSU game from 1984. And I, I came to school there in 1973 when it was just a lower bowl and just one little double-decker press box. And I saw a video, and they showed it from up above in the north end zone, and there was no boxes down the east side. There was nothing uh, other than the upper deck on the south end. So it was, it was pretty – I had to pause my, my uh, TV at the time just to watch, just to take it in and look at it. I was like, did I see this? Yeah, yeah I saw it. It, it, just, it just looks so strange hmm. nowadays. Shelton, Diff you went to school in 1973. Different. You should really think about stopping working and like doing something else. You know? <laughs> 1973, yes, sir. Um, when was y'all's first games there? My fr um, About that time, my parents took me to a game. I, I was 72, 73, and it rained. Uh, it <laughs> never rains at Tiger Stadium, but it, it did rain. Strangely, I had never been to a game in Tiger Stadium until Growing up first, in New Orleans. Yeah, 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 even though I lived, grew up in the New Orleans area. Uh, I didn't go to a game. And I, I, I'm trying to remember now. It was either Colorado or Texas A&M was their first game in 70, 1973. 
And I remember getting in the student section and sitting down there with my friends. I mean, we were like four rows from the bottom. And at that time, they let the students sit near the, nearer the sideline than in the end zone. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was quite the experience. And even though they don't have all the amenities that they have now with the fireworks and uh, all the <laughs> boxes, the suites and all that. So it was, it was kind of interesting. And, of course, you go to a game as a little kid, and the football players look like they were the size of vending machines, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they but, still do. But, yeah. uh, they're, st- they're, they're even bigger <laughs> now. Do, yeah, they're they're even big, bigger now than bigger. they were in the, yeah. in the 70s. Yeah, it's, you got to tell one real quick story about you know, just how much it means to people. My, my my mom's cousin used he sit, had his seats near the north uh, uh, goal line, and he would take me to a lot of games. And uh, he had season tickets. And there was a, there's a portal on the ground level where, uh, on the northeast side, and they would bring this. Uh, it's in, in the book. Yeah, they'd bring this old old man. He looked like he was a million years old on a stretcher, and he'd watch the games on a mirror, laying on a on a on a gurney. And, and and not just once. I'd see him game after game. I said, "This guy really loves LSU football. This guy loves Tiger it's Stadium. It, it, it's it's amazing." You, you know, it, it, none of us have been to every stadium in the country or anything like that. Some more than others, but it's hard to imagine a better setting for a big game than Tiger Stadium on Saturday night. Like, it, and and we're biased, whatever. I mean, and, and a lot of you are too. But it's it just has that feeling to it, man. On a Saturday night when it's a big game, there and, and it has to be Saturday night. It can't be during you know two thirty Saturday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. You know, no. the, then it's the, just hot. Um, yeah, the, you can't imagine this is a better place to, to be. You just feel like you're in the place in America to be watching a, a sporting event, and it's it's yeah, it's just, it's. Like Dan Borne's poem says, it's haunted and it's loud, and it and it really is. And it seems to get louder at night somehow. It's like it's like the night sky's like a like a lid on the stadium somehow. And um, it's I, yeah, it's a, I, it's a special I can give you place. two perfect examples of it. Notre Dame, nineteen seventy seventy one seventy one seventy one the first time yeah seventy one. Yeah. Saw that game. It was on ABC. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Notre Dame in seventy one, and then the Ole Miss game in nineteen seventy. When they when when they beat Archie, when beat Archie with the broken arm, yeah. they won the SEC. Moved that game to December for for national TV. I mean, you look at those two games; those probably guys of our age, probably a lot of people. Not at, not every game was on TV. No, we only saw one or two games a week. At most, two yeah. Yeah, LSU games a year were on uh, TV. We were showing then. our age, but uh, I think that kind of turned a lot of people into LSU fans. I, I would want to say. And I mean, they beat Notre Dame twenty-eight to eight, and they beat Ole Miss, I think, sixty-one seventeen. Correct. Very good. So I think I think those two games, along with the atmosphere of the night games on Saturday night, just kind of made a lot of LSU fans. And to that point, around the country, there's a certain mythology of Tiger Stadium as well, and it grew up with the fact that, like I said. Very few games were on TV back then, but you could listen to the LSU games on WWL as a clear channel station at night, and it, you could catch the games all over most of the country. Yeah, I would, you know, probably seventy-five percent of the country, and people would listen to those games. And 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 it, you know, the theater of the mind is something that's even quite different from seeing it in person. And like I listened to the nineteen seventy-nine LSU USC game when they brought the great team here with Charles Charles White There's and Marcus game. Allen and and Ronnie Lott and those guys, and it's just it, and LSU. Out punched their weight class and they took them to the wire, and uh, it was a uh, it was just tremendous to listen to it on TV. So I, I think that has helped the mythology of Tiger Stadium build up in ways that is not true for other fine stadiums around the country. New plan, Koki. You and I are just going to sit here while Sheldon <laughs> Rab tell stories. This is awesome, seriously. Exactly, it really, yeah. it really is. I got nothing. I got nothing to add. <laughs> it, it, it really is awesome. As you know, someone who hasn't been to Tiger Stadium until the more modern days. My first game was in 2017. Years. 2021. 20, 20, <laughs> yeah. But it, that was just to see it because I was living in Lafayette and working for the Lafayette advertiser at the time covering like high schools. Yeah. But I was like, oh, I got to go to a game. So I went to a couple. Oh, um, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. And before I covered the team because I never imagined that I would end up actually covering the team. So, well, yeah. It, yeah, it's pretty cool. We're, we, we, we're, we are going to talk about Nichols. Um, you're watching the LSU Sports Insider podcast. Subscribe to the LSU Sports at NOLA.com YouTube channel. Tell your friends about it. Hit the notification bell. Uh, we are going to have podcasts twice a week all the way through the school year in the basketball season, baseball season, all that kind of stuff. Uh, women's basketball. We will be covering it the whole way. Uh, Tiger Fans Associated Grocers is hiring. Join a team committed to the success of independent retail grocers. Apply today at Associated Grocers and be part of something great. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention before we really get into a breakdown of the game such as it is. Scott, you wrote a column this week 
about LSU's scheduling philosophy. And this ties into the USC game, fifth straight season opening loss for LSU. They have all been against power conference opponents. One of them was the COVID season where everyone opened with an SEC game. So right. throw that one out. But the other ones were, uh, one was a road trip to UCLA, two were against Florida State, and now the game against USC. Um, your point in this column, and we talked about this a bit on Tuesday's podcast, was that LSU should should maybe rethink the way it's doing this and, and have the, the tune-up game, the Nichols game, if you will, before the big game. Yeah, I mean, college football is the one level of football where there's no warm-up. In the NFL, has preseason games. You have jamborees in high school. You just have to go out there and execute. And it was the same for USC. You know, sure. you can say in this game. But but clearly, LSU, had, they had some timing issues. They, you know, they had three false start penalties. They had these you know egregious personal foul penalties, of course, uh, that, that that helped set up USC scores. And, and you just think they would have worked the kinks out. And, and, and Florida State has had... Games before playing LSU last both years, I, th- I think. Oh, UC- I know UCLA did one. Yeah, th- that year. And Florida State did that first yeah, year. Yeah. The first year. So uh, week zero game, I think, would benefit LSU. They've done this for a number of years now. They they've opened against the 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 tough opponent. Then they play an FCS team. It's been Grambling. It's been Southern. Now it's Nickel State this year. I, I just think they would benefit from doing it the other way around. And uh, but again, scheduling can't change just on a dime. They've got a home and home with Clemson the next two years. They go to Clemson next year. Could w- is it forbidden in the contract for them to to do that? I don't know. But it would be, I think it would behoove LSU to, to to do their best to try to play a game as soon as possible before one of these big games because uh, it's you know like it's they've just. Now, start when, now, this is where the program is right now. Like, Georgia started with Clemson, and they beat the brakes off of them. And, and, but that's Georgia. LSU Every trying game's to get a warm-up game point. for Georgia. Yeah. yeah. I, like, and Wilson and Reed on Tuesday's podcast, go back and listen to it, kind of provided the counterpoint to this. And it's, they, they said, well, to, if you just play better, then no one has a problem with it, and you're, you get a great win on your resume, and you're off and flying. It just seems like LSU's not – good at that right now at least not under brian kelly koki yeah it's 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 odd and i i do think there is like uh, just to create like a third point in this i do think there is real value and brian kelly talked about this in depth that of just understanding what your team is and isn't what after one after the first week because most teams don't get the benefit of that because they face an overmatched opponent right or an fcs team mm. so um i just th- like I, I now that we know a, i feel like us, like the fans, the media, and especially the coaching staff, just understands what what the rest of the season may may or may not look like. And yeah, they lost this game, but out of all the, the I, I think of all the five uh, opening day losses, this is probably the best performance I'd say. Um, if you think about it, because yes, that like that first Florida State game was close, but that game was a mess, absolute mess. Yes. And then yep, the, the infamous Mississippi State game and the UCLA game, they played very poorly in the second half of that game. Um, and then last year against Florida State, of course, they fell apart in the second half. And um, this game was down to the wire. I thought both teams played pretty high, pretty, you know, uh, like they, they were very, they played pretty well, at least compared to a lot of the other teams that played around the country. As I was, you know, uh, as my brain was sort of melting over the amount of college football I was watching this weekend. Um, so I... Yeah, I don't think all is lost from just a pure, you know, quality standpoint. I think they learned more about themselves. The problem is resume wise, right? When where, you know, you like to have that win, um, that big win, but you know, now your margin of error is really, really shrunk because of course you lost the USC and um, as Rab said, though, this is this is probably not going to change. They got Clemson the next two years, and the schedule only gets harder with Arizona State in 2028. <laughs> no, boy. <laughs> nice. You were ready for that one. That was nice. Yeah, I mean, look, after you play a big opening game, you're either flying high and you're, man, we've already got one of the best resume wins in the country. Like, that's how you, that's where USC is this week. They're playing, I think, Utah State, and they're like, they're already flying high. They go and beat Utah State, and they're 2-0 and and probably ranked close to the top 10, and you're off and flying. And the flip side of that is, you're LSU and you have a, you have a loss and now you're kind of licking your wounds and are we going to learn a lot about them this week? I mean, did you learn did you learn a lot about Arkansas last week, Sheldon? They beat up on Pine Bluff. Did you learn a lot about Ole Miss? Was it Furman, Furman. they played? Yeah. Even Texas plays Colorado State. At least people have heard of that team, but you're still not <laughs> learning a lot from those games. Well, you know, there was uh, <laughs> I did the math. Uh, one of one of my things I love is stats, and uh, Saturday night. By 10.30, I was just going, or Sunday night, Saturday night, 
I just put the pencil to the paper, and 10 SEC teams won by a total of 595 to 19. God. And the total yards, oh, I quit God. counting after a while. But Brian Kelly said it the other night, do you get a lot by beating the brains out of Pine Bluff or – <laughs> uh, Murray State or, you know, these teams they played, I mean, you, you have to play them, obviously, because you, you have to play at least one of those games, wouldn't you say, Reb? I mean, I mean it seems that way. It's, yeah. it's the way you get an extra so, home game. Yeah, That's what so it's you, for. Yeah, right? so you get an extra home game. But, uh, you know, Kelly said it the other day. He said, do you gain that much by playing these teams and beating them to where you're pulling your starters at halftime and then – yeah, you got your second and third stringers in there, but it's like an NFL exhibition game or a preseason yeah. game. Someone made this point to me, that going back to 2019, LSU had a easy opener. I was thinking Georgia Southern, I think. What year? 2019. The National championship year. Yeah. And then yeah, went so and played Texas. Then they went and played yeah. Texas. Would they have beaten Texas if they'd played them first? And we'll never know. I mean, that's quite so good, uh, you know. But that's an exception, right? But uh, but I think they 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 cleaned up some things, and and they you know, and then they came out and looked very good. Obviously, it was the best team LSU ever had, in my opinion. But it, they looked very good. But might they have had more trouble? It was a one score game, you know. It, it was a one score game at Texas. You know, it might have been different if they would opened in Austin instead of playing having that first game. You, know, you, you can make the argument either, either way. And Kelly makes a point. You know, what, what do you gain? What do you really know about your team if you beat somebody seventy three to nothing? I, I get it, but you do work out some kinks that obviously have tripped LSU up uh, in these five straight losses. That Texas that that Texas point you made is a really good point because that was that week two mm -hmm. that they faced them. Like in Austin, they yeah. faced them in week one. Maybe they lose, you know. So it's uh, it's it's a very good point. I, I I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you can look at it both ways, but certainly what LSU has been doing has not been working for them. So, uh, all right, they play Nickel State, six thirty p.m. Saturday night, Tiger Stadium. It may rain on your tailgate, but the rain is supposed to stop by kickoff. Um, Cokey. It never it what never rains in Tiger Stadium. Stadium. Yes, right. supposedly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> supposedly. Today it is. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're there, well, there today, you're just wet. But the field cover. I've heard that once or twice, huh? Um, Scott, in in our years around. <laughs> yes. So l let's kind of go down through this game, and and I mean again, LSU is going to have a talent advantage in a massive way at every position. Okay, this is not putting down Nickel State. We're just talking about different levels of football. Um, so. Let, let's at least kind of give some semblance of what we would like to see from LSU. Let's start when LSU has the ball on their offense. Obviously, we talked about the offensive line, you know, seeming like they were taking control of that USC game at one point, and then that just never really happened, Scott. Um, they should come out and dominate Nichols, and that's one thing to look for. What else are you looking for from the LSU offense? I want to see Garrett Nussmeyer run the ball. I'm like intentionally run the ball, not just scrambling away from, from pressure or something like that. They moved him around, and he's got mobility. But it, it seemed like USC, was, uh, uh, one of the LSU players said yesterday they were, they were putting uh, – yeah, they are filling the gaps with safeties, and they, they were, looked like they were bringing extra guys because they didn't fear – that he was going to take off and run a la Jaden Daniels. And he's not going to run like Jaden Daniels. There's not going to be anything close to that. And that's fine. That's not an indictment of Garrett. They're just different quarterbacks. But I would, I think you got to put it out there that, that you have to fear that he, he might, you know, tuck it and, and, and run on a keeper. So I, I'd like to see that, you know, happen in, in the game uh, on Saturday. Yeah. It makes those, it makes those, you know, uh, facing the defense, you know, like, like, uh, Handoffs, play action, all that stuff more effective if the quarterback can also run and, and get some yards with his own legs. And um, I mean, personally, I wish they would go under center more. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it's just a lot easier to run play action and, and make that and make those runs more effective when the quarterback's back is turned to the defense because it's easier to hide the ball. The defense has there's a second or two where the defense doesn't know if the running back is the ball or the quarterback is the I, ball. I like I like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's why they run it in the pros. It's why the pros still do it to this day. And I it, it, the college game is uh, and it's not just LSU. I, most colleges don't really run you know under center play action anymore. Um, and I just kind of wish that they could add that to their playbook, especially when they don't have a quarterback who can run. When you have a quarterback who can run, it makes it, – it, it's it, you don't really it, – it's not as necessary, I guess, to have the under center play action. But when you when you don't have a quarterback that is as dynamic as Jaden Daniels, for example, when you have Garrett Nussmeyer quarterback, it makes more sense to maybe try that out at least. Yeah, I man. 
You're not going to add that in the middle of the season if you're. <laughs> I because know. a lot of mistakes will happen. I but. just wish they ha- like this is something you think of in July to implement in August, right? right? right. And I know we're way too late for that now, and they almost never run anything under under center. And I would like to see them run quarterback sneaks on third and one, and fourth and one, and fourth and inches, but they don't do that either. And um, I, I don't know why exactly this is the case. With not just L- again, this isn't just LSU. This is most colleges, but um, it's something that. I, that could help them, I, I think. But again, I, like you said, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. I, w- I would like to see them, uh, and you're going to see it, run the ball because they have to. Um, you know, they got to throw it a little bit. They, they have to keep getting their timing down, stuff like that. But uh, looking at the depth charts last night, is Nichols is very small on their front seven, and LSU is going to, you know, they, they want to establish that run. That they didn't do a great job of against USC, but they did better in the second half, as Koki pointed out, with John Emery. He's gone now, but those three guys, you're going to have to rely on them. And uh, I think Caden, uh, young Caden Durham and Caleb Jackson and Josh Williams are going to, they're going to get some touches Saturday night. I mean, I, I, I can see them, you know, they, you know, they, they say, they're probably sitting there going like, we have to run the ball this year. And, this is the perfect game to work on it and do it. You got to get through this game healthy with yep. those running backs, yeah. especially. Um, Put them and, in a bubble wrap, maybe. I don't yeah, know. and like like most FCS teams, Nichols is obviously small in their front seven, as as you pointed out. They actually did a pretty good job against Louisiana Tech against the run. Um, they, they held them to three point two yards per attempt on the ground, which is not bad against an FBS team. Um, Louisiana Tech isn't supposed to be that great this season, but um, at the same time, they, I, their front seven was probably the most impressive part of their defense, just from a pure numbers standpoint. Even if production wise, that's not the case. Um, it probably doesn't matter a whole time because LSU is a different level of athletes compared to Louisiana Tech as well. So um, it's just something to keep in mind because that and their pass rush was pretty was pretty good in this game too. They had two sacks and nine pressures. So yeah, and I'll say this: I mean, if you're if you're holding an FBS team, and I I don't care if it's La Tech or anybody to 3.2 yards per carry, that means you're at least disciplined in staying in your run fits. You're you're you know you're you're not giving up huge holes because. If you're giving up huge holes, Louisiana Tech's going to run for more than 3.2 yards per carry. So, But I, I agree with you, Sheldon. They're going to run, I would think, at least for 200 yards, if not 300. I mean, they, they want to run the ball. Have to. Um, Have to. And so that that's what we'll see, I think, at they least early in the game. At least. Yeah. yeah. Now, we'll also see a lot of young players um, see some of the depth at running back, see some of the depth at receiver with Chris Hilton probably not playing, Kyle Parker Probably not playing. Kelly made a point of saying he they want to get Shelton Sampson. Then you got to get yeah. him involved in the offense. So there's a young I, receiver right there that needs to. Make I would some I would expect Chris Hilton and um, Kyle Parker probably not to play because why risk it unless right. they're totally 100 percent healthy and we don't know that Doesn't for sure. Like yeah, if this was a big game, I don't think Parker would play. I think Hilton probably would. Would. Um, mm-hmm. But there's no point of playing Hilton this yeah. week. I mean, when you have an SEC game next week. Um, and with your Shelton Sampson point, I, I think they want to get him going because he's a potential vertical threat for them. And I think after that USC game, they kind of realized that, oh, we need more vertical threats outside of just Lacey because if Lacey and or Hilton are hurt, and again, this is nitpicking with the receiving core. I thought they did a very good job against USC. You could use that extra field stretcher, that that true X receiver on the outside, someone who can, um, you know, stretch, who can, you know, threaten the defense vertically. And obviously Hilton can do that, but he was out. And they have Lacey, but you, 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 it's nice to have another option there at the very least. Aaron Anderson could be a, a yeah. I mean, yeah. he he came here touted for his speed and you he know, knew a little bit of everything. He knew a little bit of everything. Yeah. Okay. Flip things around when Nichols has the ball. Um, it, you know, look at Louisiana Tech. They didn't get a bunch of yards. They were not a great offensive team last year either. I think they went six and five. Um, but they do spread the ball around a bit. A lot of different skill position players got a touch against La Tech. Um, and so, you know, maybe that stresses LSU's defense in some ways. But what do you guys want to see, Sheldon, from LSU's on the defensive side of the ball? Well, on the defensive side, obviously the front seven played well last week. They got pressure on the quarterback. They didn't get him down every time. I don't know. I don't remember how many sacks they wound up with. I know Savion Jones played he had two, right? They he had, had two. two. He had both of them. Yeah. Uh, or he had two. Uh, Savion Jones, I thought played lights out the other night. I, I don't know just watching it once. I didn't watch the replay, but uh, I thought Savion Jones, you know, kind of set the tone for them. Um, I think the defensive tackles played really well. 
And, and uh, again, looking at the depth charts, um, Nichols is not very big across their offensive front. There's a couple of guys go 290. Um, so that's, you know, not, not what all she's going to see in SEC play. So you would expect them to rule the front, you know, and, and you know, uh, you know, again, the secondary, I think, has to keep on showing showing up and uh, doing good things. I mean, they had two penalties. Uh, I think Brian Kelly kind of took um, – uh, disputed one of them and said, you know, that it wasn't – he thought it wasn't a pass interference penalty. So, I mean, you got so many young guys back there uh, that, that didn't start last year. And it's it's, it's going to have to – so you have to see more of that. I, I know – uh, Nickel State only threw for I think 138 yards against La Tech, so uh, yeah. this could be a good good test for their secondary. Much like the running backs, they know they have to run the ball on offense. LSU does. They know that their DBs have to keep getting better, and this is a good good game to do it. As long as LSU stops the run on early downs, they'll be fine this game defensively because. It's, Nichols is a team that seems like they're going to want to run the ball, at least on early downs, to set up you know, more favorable situations with a quarterback who Pat McQuaid is not, who just wasn't very efficient and hasn't been very efficient as their, <clears throat> as their starter. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're running back Colin Guggenheim at 79 rushing yards and 18 carries, so that's something to keep an eye out for, and they're going to give him the ball, and they ran the ball a whole bunch against Louisiana Tech. So if they stop the run early downs and enforce them to third and longs, then pin your ears back and get past that offensive line because that Nichols offensive line really struggled against Tech. They gave him five sacks in that game. Um, and he, yeah, it's simple, simple as that. Just out, they're going to out-athlete them in the in those third downs and getting yourself into a good situation where you can just pin your ears back and get after the quarterback, that's that's going to be the best way. that That's their best avenue to potential turnovers in this game. Um, disru- disruptive plays. There was only one turnover in the USC game. Yeah. That was the interception Garrett threw on the very last drive, which, you know, the game was basically over at that point. They were so far deep in their own end. But but LSU was very close to getting a couple of turnovers in, in that game, uh, an interception by uh, uh, Wood Weeks and, a, and a, a, another chance they had a fumble recovery that uh, USC lineman <laughs> fell on. Uh, Blake Baker said it in the preseason. They, they want to have more disruptive plays. I think, I think they... And that was one thing they they were disruptive. They just didn't kind of get over the top with that, you know. So uh, it would be confidence building for this defense, which needs all the confidence <laughs> building that it can get to 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 be disruptive. Even against a nickel state and force some turnovers, maybe maybe get a pick six or a fumble recovery or certainly some some more sacks, things like that. Uh, I think that would that would help them build confidence and momentum in themselves going forward in SEC play. That's exactly what I was going to say. Wreck some havoc, which you should be able to do and cash them in for turnovers, and then, uh, you know, limit big plays, because if Nichols is getting big plays on you, Mm. chances are probably anybody is going to, and that's one thing that plagued LSU last year. You want to limit those big... Plagued them against USC. Yeah, they're they're not going to lose this this game. They're not going to give up a bunch of points, but if they give up three or four 20-plus yard plays, that's still, to me, a big cause for concern. So those those are keys to me. Um, Speaking of keys, we're going to do our keys to the game. The keys to the game segment is proudly sponsored by Associated Grocers. Join our team and support the success of local independent retail grocers apply today for available positions at associated grocers um keys of the game guys i got two for you and you, you can just agree or add or whatever number one number two number three number four number five is stay healthy don't get anybody <laughs> else hurt in this game okay and then and then the other one is let a lot of guys play let's see some of lsu's depth and their young guys get some time in this game too 20 carries or or you know 15 carries and five catches something some combination of that at least 20 touches for Caden Durham in this game because you need to keep the, your top two guys healthy first of all and second of all you need to see what this kid has in a game scenario so um I this is kind of the perfect situation for him that even if John Emery was healthy I would have said something similar so especially without John Emery now you you need this kid to be pl- to play in SEC games at least you know a little bit so you want to see what you have at, in this game that's what I say you said um you know, about the big plays, they give up 12 plays of 15 yards or more against USC. Cut the way down, you know, like you know, maybe four. You know, it would be a that'd be a reasonable goal. And 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 you always want offensive balance, but I think especially considering how much they struggle the ball. Aside from you take away Emory's long 39 yard run, LSU averaged 3.1 yards per carry against USC. You, you want to strive for balance. You don't need to throw the ball. You shouldn't need to throw the ball a whole lot. So you're hoping to have a 200 yard night, 200 plus yard rushing night, and a 200 plus yard passing night. I think that would be i think that would be make brian kelly very happy when he looks at the fi- final box score if he got those numbers 
I, I think they're going to get probably over 500 yards total offense and at least. Uh, question is, in the third quarter, is it Ricky Collins or A.J. Swan? That's a great point. I, hmm. I, I, you know, I think both might play. They m- might each get a quarter. Uh, but, I mean, I think from what we saw and a little bit we saw in preseason camp, I think it's going to be Ricky Collins. But um, guys like that need to get some snaps in a, in a real game. Uh, like a preseason game, you know, it's like a, like an NFL exhibition game. They have yes. to get, they have to, they're going to have to get some snaps. I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, depending on how the first half goes, I don't think we'll see Garrett Nussmeyer in the second half. Yep. Okay. Those are our keys to the game. They're brought to you by Associated Grocers. We owe you one more break. We're going to take that and we will be back with our Nichols versus LSU predictions right after this. Since 1988, Classic Industrial Services, Inc. has led the industry in specialty contracting. From thermal insulation to scaffolding, coatings and beyond, we cover it all. Every minute matters in our commitment to quality and safety. We're here to serve with roofing, siding, heat trace and refractory services. Visit ClassicIndustrial.com for more information. Welcome back to the LSU Sports Insider Podcast. It's Thursday, September the 5th. We're previewing LSU versus Nickel State. Going to get to some predictions in just a minute. First, we're going to do our uh, our sports betting segment with Thomas Casale. It is sponsored by the Queen Casino. And let's see what Thomas has to say. Hey, everyone. Well, today I'm going to give you my SEC pick of the week. You know, we got LSU's playing Nichols. They're going to be a huge favorite. They'll be able to name their number there. I'm going to go to another SEC team in Auburn at home, laying 13 points to Cal at DraftKings Sportsbook. I think this is an interesting team, Auburn. I feel like they're on the upswing in the SEC, not ready to compete with the top top teams like Georgia and Texas yet. But I think Hugh Freeze has built the talent on both sides of the ball. These two teams played last year. Auburn won 14 to 10 in the worst football game you'll ever see. In my opinion, Auburn has gotten a lot better since then. Cal has kind of stayed the same. At Auburn, I think the Tigers cover the 13 points at home. Thank you, Thomas. And so he picks Auburn to cover against Cal. Betting line for this one just came out, by the way. Um, LSU's favored by 51 and a half over Nickel State. So if you want to bet on the Tigers, uh, ah. we'll, we'll see how we think about that in a minute. Have you ever seen them that big a uh, favorite? I'm sure they have been. Uh, yeah, yeah, Grambling or something. Grambling last, last year was last, similar to that. Yeah. It's usually around 50. Yeah. Uh, the, Queen, the Queen of Baton Rouge proudly sponsors the Sports Insiders sports betting segment with Thomas Casale. Experience the thrill of game day at 1717 Kitchen and Cocktails, your premier destination for elevated sports entertainment. Let's go around the SEC for a minute, guys. Uh, Around the SEC is brought to you by Classic Industrial Services because at Classic Industrial Services, every minute matters and every game matters. What are we watching in the SEC this week? Well, Texas goes to Michigan. One of the only times in history a uh, defending national champion has been this big of an underdog at home. Uh, what else you got? Well, I mean, I, um, obviously Texas and Michigan is a big one. Uh, a game that, you know, may not mean a whole lot at the end of the year, or, but first SEC game of the year is South Carolina at Kentucky. So Somebody uh, going to be in first get place. To, get to see a, yeah, you get to see an SEC game. Um, those two teams have been kind of – Battling behind Georgia in the last couple of years, especially with Florida being down, they've kind of been hovering up there thinking they have a chance to win the SEC East. And, of course, they don't or they didn't. Uh, And then lately they've both kind of fallen, you know, near 500 records. I mean, uh, you know, South Carolina has certainly been – they've been a bowl game a couple of years ago, but they've kind of both – Kentucky's been the bowl games. But – 
neither one of them seemed like they could win more than eight, nine games to make a make a difference. But uh, you'll get to see both of them. But in the one league SEC now, I mean, they're probably going to finish, you know, 11, 12, somewhere in that area. Kentucky may finish 10, somewhere around there. But you now you've got Texas and Oklahoma to, to push people mm. further down, uh, <laughs> further down the, uh, the the totem pole. So uh, it's kind of interesting to have an SEC game this week. It's it's the only one uh, of SEC, SEC teams. And the, yeah, and it's good for LSU fans to watch that South Carolina, South Carolina. Kentucky game because LSU is playing South Carolina next week. So that's definitely notable. I think Cal at Auburn is a very strange game that I'm a little bit curious about because Classic Cal, ACC, SEC rivalry. Yeah, yeah. ACC, SEC rivalry. Cal's <laughs> got this. Cal's been this very strange program for the last, like, I don't know, almost decade, at least at least the last five or six years since um, I even covered a game there once. Um, and uh, it, Justin Wilcox is feel like he feels like he's been there forever. Feels like they're around six or seven wins every single season. Um, the offense is like is it w- heading into the year seemed like it would be decent, but they only scored thirty one against UC Davis. So um, and then Auburn, of course, like I don't know Auburn. It, it's I, I think there's a lot of optimism with their defense and with the receivers, but at the same time. Uh, we, we're not quite confident about the quarterback. At least a lot of people aren't very confident about yeah. Peyton Thorne um, coming back for a second season at Auburn. So uh, I'm just kind of curious to see what are the state of those two teams. Can those two teams even contend to be top 25 teams at some point? They played season? They played Berkeley last year. Wasn't it like 10-6 yeah. or yeah, something? Yeah, it was an ugly game. Ugly, yeah. ugly. Rab, I think Mich- uh, Texas, too, like if they're going to be national championship contenders like everyone thinks they are, this is a game where, like, I know you're on the road and Michigan's tough and everything. You kind of go up and and this is this kind of a prove it game for Texas's credentials. Yeah, Michigan they, they kind of struggled a little bit. Someone said to take Michigan in the points last week when he was in, when I was in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. and they, 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 they missed, missed that by they, one, one by the point, way. Yeah, by, by one, one point. point. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's it's, it's, it's a uh, it's a showdown game, and, and Michigan can prove that they they're still worthy national championship contender. Uh, uh, I, I'm surprised you didn't mention that uh, Mississippi State's going to the Valley of the Sun. Uh, that is uh, true. On Saturday, they, so this is they're going where to I can. Where this is where I can drop this fun fact. Arizona State has never beaten an SEC team in the history of the, wow. the history of the program, which is wow. an unbelievable. Are they getting stat. it this week? I think they are. Yeah, well, th- well, that's that's why they're. I mean, Kenny Dillingham, the head coach at ASU, has been trying to hype up the crowd to, to show up to the game because they're pitching this whole thing. You, you might see history this week. We're going to beat an SEC team, and granted, it's might be the worst SEC team. It's probably the worst SEC, SEC team after what we saw from Vanderbilt last week. Um, but Man, I, Vandy's going to go 2-0. and They're going to beat Alcorn State, you would think. I think uh, Vandy will be 3-0. and They play somebody else next week. Man, they should handle, too. Because uh, I, 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 I've covered a lot of NASCAR, so I, you know, you're interested to in see what happens when, when the, when the pileups come on. Uh, the Florida-Stanford game, uh, Samford game intrigues. Not Stanford. Samford, the in-state team. Uh, no, they're from, from uh, Alabama. Excuse you, me. Better uh, you better job. win that one. You better win that one, boy. Cause, but they've lost. The Graham Mertz is out, right? I mean, they're they're, they're yeah. going with a backup quarterback. It's uh, it's a mess. It's a mess for Billy Napier, man. I just it's... you just kind of want. You're kind of curious to see how bad can it get? You right, know, right. If they're trailing at halftime yeah. to Samford. Or something. I got I got to ask Koki though. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Got to ask Koki. Uh, is it going to be Big Ten after dark? Uh, I think the game is that like... It? 9 30. It's 9 30. It's 9 30. Right. It's 9 30. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not the same as Pac no, 12 after dark. I know. It's so sad. Um, <laughs> I hope to catch the end of that game uh, after the LSU game, which. Well, Cal what? is in the Big Ten, right? <laughs> No, I'm not sure. ACC. Cal's in the ACC. <laughs> ACC after dark. State's Excuse me. No, ASU is in the Big 12. Big 12. Big 12. Big 12. Big 12. 12 we got to have a chart in here, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The other one I'll mention. Uh, Tennessee at NC State. Mm-hmm. N- Nico Iamaleva looked. I think I'm saying wow. that right. He, he, Whoa, that, was, that was really good. That wasn't good. It was spot on. I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe after the show. Extra bonus. Nico bonus Iamaleva points. looked really good last week. He's been hyped up. He looked good in Tennessee's bowl game. They they step up in class this week, so we'll see. I think Tennessee wins that game, but it'll be interesting to see how they do too. So another one to uh, look out for. Today's episode of LSU Insider is brought to you by Classic Industrial Services, proudly serving. 
Louisiana and the entire United States. They have a whole list of things they can do for you. Metal siding and roofing, steam and electric tracing systems, commercial coatings, refractory services, general maintenance, large capital projects, commercial projects, small quick response needs. Classic Industrial is your go-to for quality and safety. They're not just about business. They're a proud community partner supporting local initiatives and helping build a stronger Baton Rouge because at Classic Industrial Services, every minute matters. Guys, it's prediction time. Our prediction segment is proudly sponsored by Waste Pro. <coughs> Ensure your tailgate or event is a hit with clean and convenient portable toilets from Waste Pro. Rent yours today. LSU versus Nichols. Uh, quick score prediction, and then we're going to go with a Super Bowl pick as well because the NFL starts tonight with the Chiefs and the Ravens. Chiefs going for a three-peat. I'll go first. I got LSU beating Nichols 62-7. to Give me that cover. Give me at least three takeaways for the LSU defense. They're going to wreck some havoc. They're going to take out some frustrations. I got 62-7. to Sheldon, how about you? I had 56-7. to I think they'll score 42 in the first half and turn it over Shut to the down. young guys. And they uh, might, not, not, might not cover that spread. Oh, I got my, my Super Bowl pick, by the way, I said this on the Saints Insider yesterday. I got an all-green Super Bowl in New Orleans, the Eagles beating the Jets. Wow. The Jets. The, Jets. Wow. the Eagles beating the Jets. We're going wow. off script, baby. Uh, Sheldon, what's your Super Bowl pick? Uh, haven't thought about it. All right, I we'll come know. back to you. Uh, okay, come we'll come back, back to you. <laughs> Rab, Rab, what you got for LSU and Nichols? Uh, I, I, didn't get the, I didn't get the winning team right last week, but I got the under. Uh, LSU and USC. It came way under yep. that, that total. Sure did. I'm going with the under again. I'm only picking LSU 41-16. I think Nickel State is a decent team. Yeah, they're defending uh, their conference championship. Uh, I think LSU is still going to have some empty possessions. Uh, they still got some kinks to work out. Um, uh, and they're going to give up some points and yards. So uh, 41-16 uh, is uh, my score there. And the Super Bowl, how can you not pick the Kansas City Chiefs? How, how can you pick? How can, trying to three become the first three-peat. Champion in Super Bowl, in the Super Bowl era, the Chiefs over the uh, the uh, the Eagles sound good. I'll, I'll go with the Eagles. Okay. You sure it's not the chefs? <laughs> but I love that commercial. Very good. I love that commercial. If it's forty-one to sixty, let's say it's like twenty-one to nine at halftime or something. Like people are going to be restless. It is restless. Yes. Is that the word? Yeah. <laughs> they're gonna be they're, they're gonna be uh out of their minds. Yeah, it, they, they will not be happy with that if that's the case. Koki, how about you? Uh I think LSU wins forty nine to ten, and I agree with everything Zach said. But I, it's it's just, it's just gonna be hard to reach that line when the when again when the second and third stringers are in the game in the third and fourth quarter, and their the same urgency probably isn't there to keep on scoring points and the pile on. So like that's the problem with like picking the over on some of these uh, on some of these lines with these like big block games. It's just hard to it's hard to it's a it's very hard to know whether they're actually gonna like keep on pushing right uh, because we, if we know we know if they kept on pushing they'd win by more than 50 um so i it's uh so i i just sort of landed with that score um and then for the super bowl had to pick the chiefs because i just feel like it, the afc is really tough but I, I mean they last year was like the worst case scenario for them roster wise and they still won the whole thing um uh and and then on in the NFC side, I, I really like the Packers this year. I think they're a really, really good, good team. Um, who wins between those two teams? I mean, gun to my head, I'd say the Chiefs, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Packers won at all because I just, I mean, they were the youngest team in football last year, and they were this close to making the NFC Championship game. I only see the, I, I think this, I, you know, the, the, the ceiling's so high with that team. Yeah. Sheldon? Uh, now that I've had a whole minute to think about it, um, <laughs> somebody's got to pick Joe Burrow, right? I, well, no, no, at um, the Superdome. No, I think uh, tonight might be a Super Bowl preview on September the fifth. Uh, AFC Championship. It's not a yeah, yeah AFC Championship game. I meant, um, but I like the Chiefs. Uh, I could go with the Ravens, but I'll pick the Chiefs. I like Patrick Mahomes, obviously, and um, I, I I'll pick them to go over the uh, Eagles. All right. I think so the Eagles are going to, you know, they got a running back now. They got a better running back, and they got a quarterback, and they got plenty of receivers. So uh, I'm going to go with the Eagles you know, uh, in the Super Bowl. We got Chiefs Ravens tonight. We got Packers Eagles, which is a great game in Brazil tomorrow night. And then, of course, LSU Nichols on Saturday before the first NFL Sunday and this Jets season. And Niners so. on Monday. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a good football weekend, and I'll, guys. And I'll pick the Chiefs to win it all. All right, anyway. that's the LSU Sports Insider for today. One one more piece of business before we go. And, Sheldon, we, we – 
told you you wouldn't have to talk, but how, how many years is this at The Advocate now for you? 46 years, three months, four, and 27 days my, as of Saturday night it, with the Nickel State game. Let, look, you deserve the ovation. When I grow up, I want to be Sheldon Mickles. Congratulations <laughs> on uh, riding into the sunset. Two, two-thirds of my life has been spent here. Rep, tell, <laughs> us, rep, tell us a good Sheldon story before we go. <laughs> There's too many, too There's, many to tell. There are too many. I, but no, I, I'm, I'm blanking. I'm trying to think of, a, you know, we've been to some great moments together. Of course, he covered the Saints for, for a lot of years. Uh, those, those, those videos we had to do at, at the NCAA tournament at the Sweet 16, those were fun. Those huh? are fun. You know, the, when the Virginia Tech fans are streaming past us. What is your? Highlight. What is the one moment? Uh, it, it, you know, it, is it the Super Saint Super Bowl win? Is it the Falcons game in two thousand six? I mean, it, I, I would think Super Bowl win. I, I mean, after the game, you just sitting there going, "What did I just see? What did I just see?" Mm. You know, you didn't realize it. You didn't believe it. Of course, we were on deadline. Tracy Porter runs the interception back, and you're going like, "What do I do now?" Out of your fingers. Yeah, yeah you go <laughs> like, "What do you do now?" You got to write something. But um, <laughs> yeah, the Super Bowl was uh, the Super Bowl was crazy. Cover the Saints for 30 years. I, I have, I've had people say you should be a saint for doing that. <laughs> but I mean, it was my job, and I did it. I loved doing it. I covered over 540 games, uh, preseason, uh, regular season, postseason games, and. Uh, up until recently, I covered every one of their postseason games, but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been it's been fun and thirty years doing that. And I started doing preps and covered some Southern University football, and basketball, and LSU football and basketball and track. Uh, covered Gym- track for 40, 45 years, You've been to a couple of College World Series finals, yep. right? Yep. So it's been a good ride. Good ride. Time to Look, time to do something else. I don't know what the hell we're gonna do without you, man. But congratulations, and uh, and we'll miss you. And and this is a fitting goodbye. So that's our LSU Sports Insider podcast for today. Our producers Emile Cotton for Koki Riley, Scott Rabelais, and most of all for Sheldon Mickles. I'm Zach Ewing, and we'll see you next time.